I work um, at the University of Toronto. I, ha- I, I lead a, a team at Google DeepMind here in Toronto, and I have been a member uh, of uh, the Vector Institute for some time. And um, I, I've worked on a variety of, of topics over the last few years, which, which include computational biology and neuroscience. But what I want to talk about today is, um, is, is really the amazing properties of generative diffusion models. And, and um, many of you, I'm sure, have, have heard of diffusion models uh, because they've received a tremendous amount of attention, both in the popular media and in the research community uh, for, for about two or three years now. Um, but what I wanted to do to start, um, just to give you some perspective, I started working on on generative models about 25 years ago. And at that time, the principal goals were really to learn prior distributions over data, which could help regularize inverse problems like denoising images or super resolution. And, and we thought if we could do that, we would have hit the ball out of the park. Uh, the, the other the other type of problem that people were trying to use generative models for at the time was representation learning, where the goal was essentially to try and, and disentangle the causal factors of variation in data with, with the idea that if you had a representation good enough to synthesize images, you must really understand the data or the images. But one thing at that time uh, that's really important to note is that the concept that you could use a generative model to generate a high resolution image that looked anything reason looked like anything reasonable was far fetched at the time we all thought i mean we didn't even think that that was a goal because the results just were not there and everything changed about 10 years ago with with the emergence of variational autoencoders uh deep autoregressive models for generating images and and generative adversarial networks Everything changed because all of a sudden these deep learning generative models were able to generate amazing images. And now it's actually interesting when I started to prepare this talk, I actually went back and looked at at some of those early papers to get some inspiration for the talk. And, and when you actually look at the images they were able to generate, they're horrible. And, and at least by today's standards, but it gives you a sense of we were excited. I mean, for us at the time, working away in the garage, doing what we, we, we were doing, this was a fantastic result. These were inspiring images, and it really boosted the amount of interest in the field, and it led to a, 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 a huge research thrust, which out of which all sorts of much, much better models emerged, and, and in particular, GANs, by 2019, models like StyleGAN and BigGAN were generating really impressive high-resolution images. These are images from BigGAN uh, on the left at resolution 256 by 256, and on the right at resolution 512 by 512. And, and, and these are samples from ImageNet classes. ImageNet, I, I'm assuming... Many of you know about ImageNet, uh, an image data set of a thousand classes that is the standard benchmark for, for machine learning and image classification, or at least was for, for quite some time. Um, and, and, and so GANs had really taken off and they were the model of choice for some time, but, but it, just in the last two or three years, diffusion models have largely unseated GANs as the model of choice, at least for, for, for media, for images, for video, uh, for auditory signals, speech, music, et cetera. And, and, and again, because they received so much press, I, I'm gonna assume you know something about how diffusion models work, but, but at a very, very high level, like other generative models, like variational autoencoders and GANs, the underlying idea is to learn to transform 
a tractable distribution that we can sample from into like the, the normal distribution I'm showing here on the right and, and transform that into a, a target empirical distribution, which is typically very, very complex like that on the left. And diffusion models do this essentially by generating um, a, a sequence of smoothed distributions, and it can either be discrete or, or continuous, um, uh, distributions um, that go from the empirical distribution to the normal distribution by essentially progressively smoothing the empirical distribution. And then given that sequence, you can draw samples by first drawing a sample from the normal distribution here, the small dot on the right. I, I hope you can see it at the back. Um, and, and, then, and, and then you can use that sample as an initial guess for a sample from the next distribution to its left, and then use a neural network to correct that sample just a little bit to ensure that it's a fair sample from the marginal distribution uh, the next, uh, to the left of the normal. And, and you, you then do this repeated, repeatedly, iteratively sampling all the way until from distribution to distribution until you, you have obtained a fair sample from your desired empirical distribution. Now with images, this whole process is, is, is remarkably simple because um, you accomplish the smoothing of the empirical distribution just by adding noise to the image. And so as you move, for example, from left to right on the screen here, you're seeing more and more noise added to an image, and that is effectively representing the distribution becoming smoother and smoother and smoother until the samples at the far right, which are just pure white noise, are samples from a normal distribution. And the key element of a diffusion model is really this neural network, which at each step is used in this gradual sampling process. And it effectively is a denoising process because what we're starting is with a sample of Gaussian noise on the right. And at each step, we're essentially using a neural network to remove a little bit more of the noise and reveal a little bit more of, of the image. And this is typically done um, with, with a, um, a, a, a deep neural UNET, which is a multi-scale neural network. Um, and, and so it has a, a variety of, of convolutional levels, which, which take you from high scale down to low scale. And then they typically have some form of self-attention, global self-attention at the lowest levels or the low resolution uh, layers of the network. And the whole network, which is a form of denoiser, is trained as a collection of nonlinear least squares problems. So, so it, it has all these beautiful properties, stable to train uh, and easy for people like me to understand, which, which was, was fantastic. Now, the models that I'm gonna talk about today and most of the models that we use in practice are actually conditional models, which is to say that, that the input to this neural denoiser network is not only a noisy image, but also a conditioning signal. And that conditioning signal could be something like a class label from ImageNet, or in the case of text to image models, it could be a contextualized embedding of open vocabulary text. Or for image to image translation problems, it, it might be a, an image. Um, and, and for example, the, the first models that we began playing with back in late 2021 um, were models for super resolution, where we really wanted to take very low resolution models, um, low resolution images, excuse me, and, and expand the resolution up. In this case, what I'm showing here is expanding the resolution up 16 times. And, and when you start to take a, a, a small image, like a 64 by 64 image, and, and expand that up to a 1K image, the task is very much a generative task because you're hallucinating a tremendous amount of structure in the image. And we, we then, we were, we were super impressed by these results. And so we then moved on 
to looking at a wider range of image restoration problems, problems like, like in painting, where you want to uh, replace part of an image that's missing or uncropping where you want to expand an image or colorization where you're given a, a grayscale image and you want to create color samples. And we actually started building multitask models. So single diffusion models, which would do any one of these tasks as long as you gave it a conditioning signal that also told it which task you wanted to do. Um, and, 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 and one really interesting thing uh, about diffusion models for this task is that their ability to capture really complex multimodal distribution really shines through in the results where, for example, for the, the, the grayscale image on the left, at the top left, when you draw random samples from the diffusion model for the output, you get all sorts of different colorizations of the same image, suggesting that again, it's really captured the conditional distribution over your output space, given your input. Um, and, 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 and again, for in painting and uncropping, it does a great job at capturing these complex distributions. And, and, and from there, we moved on to, to to looking at cascaded models where rather than just having one super resolution layer, we have multiple stages of super resolution. So we can go from small images like 32 by 32 all the way up to 4K images. And we started doing this first conditioned on labels, for example, from ImageNet. And then we started doing it for open vocabulary text. And, and, and the result of this research was the Imagine text to image model, which, which we released in 2022. And, and that, just to give you a sense of what it, what it produces, um, it produces exquisite resolution up to 4K images, which is this one shown here. Um, we use the same basic idea of a, a cascade of a, a, a base model followed by temporal and spatial upsampling layers to do then text from video. And, 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 and I, should, I should qualify, I'm just showing you results from my team at Google DeepMind. Um, but suffice it to say, there are many groups around the world doing really phenomenal research uh, and producing similarly strong models for text to image, for text to video, uh, text to music, et cetera. Um, uh, um, but I, I'm just selectively showing these because these are the samples that I had readily available. So, so progress was really amazing, but there's a, a, a question which is, well, how good are these models really? How do we understand how good they are and, and what, what are they good for? I mean, what are they good for beyond creative content generation, you know, text to image or text to video? Are they good for other tasks? Now, in the field, we have all sorts of standard performance measures for generative models of images. And, and, and you will have seen some of these scores. Maybe you've worked, many of you may have worked with these, but people use the FID score. And I guess FID sounds, stands for something like uh, Frisché Inception Distance, right? And it, it, it's a measure of the, the distribution gap between your training images and the images you generate. And of course, the, the smaller that distance, the more your generative model is generating stuff that looks like your, your real data. And, and people have, have things like the Inception score. And, and, and these are very coarse, sort of crude measures of performance. They're really great for tracking the progress in the field, but it, it turns out they don't correlate super strongly with human perception. They're pretty good, but they're not great. And, and so people have over the last few years begun to think about, well, what are the other ways that we might evaluate how these models work, why they work so well, and and um, and have stronger benchmark performance tests so that we can really understand progress as the models get better and better. And 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 one way to do that is to consider performance on downstream tasks. So so the idea here is that 
if a generative model really captures the empirical data distribution well, then the, the performance on some downstream task, the expected performance under the model should really look like the expected performance under real data. Or, or to put that in really concrete terms, if I train my ImageNet classifier on synthetic data, it should work just as well as my ImageNet classifier trained on real data. And so, so why don't we do that? Um, similarly, you could hypothesize that if your generative model works really well, you should be able to generate samples of data and add it to the real data to essentially expand your training set beyond the real data and see gains in performance, see improved robustness. Um, the, the idea of, and, and we call this generative data augmentation. And, and, and the re this is interesting because manual forms of augmentation on training data have been used for decades in machine learning where, where for example, in the original MNIST classification world where people would take handwritten digits and try and recognize them, the training sets were reasonably small. And so people came up with all sorts of different ways to distort the images in various ways while retaining the identity of the digit that was written, and then use those expanded data sets to, to, to train classifiers. So one of the common methods, for example, was elastic deformation, that you would deform the image little bits to represent you know, different variations of writing style. And, and people have used, used augmentations all over the place. You, 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 Often when we train classifiers, we take different random crops from the image to represent the fact that, you know, your, your, your classifier should be somewhat shift invariant to where the object is in the image. Or, or when we're using uh, images, for example, for learning contrastive models of text and, and images, often we'll use color augmentations that will we'll manipulate the color of the image in various ways so that the embedding or the representation of the image doesn't depend overly on the very specific colors of any given training image. And these methods really have been honed generally by graduate students and, and, and faculty and other researchers over many years to work incredibly well. If generative models really capture the structure of natural images, then you would think that and, and in, in particular, if they capture the meaningful factors of variation in data, they should be a great way of generating augmentations. Um, and so, so with this backdrop, um, Ravuri and Vignoles um, back in 2019 came up with a proposal. They introduced something called the classification accuracy score. And, and, and the idea was super simple. But, but, but it's quite powerful. Um, what they said is, look, take your generative model, generate a bunch of data, train an ImageNet classifier on your synthetic data, and then test it against real data. Test it with real data, in particular, against a baseline model, which was trained on real data as well. And if your generative model is really good, the models trained on synthetic data should match performance. Um, and, and, and they did this by prescribing a, a very specific protocol that, that you're gonna use a very specific form of neural net. You're gonna use a ResNet 50. You're gonna train it for a specific number of epochs, et cetera. And, and, and so they, they prescribed the entire process so that the only factor of variation between these models is whether you use synthetic data or real data. Okay, and, and of course, in the paper, they did this. Um, but what they found is that the state-of-the-art models at the time didn't work well. So um, in, in particular, so for, for example, here they, 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 they used a, 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 um, a big GAN model and they used a VQ VAE model, state-of-the-art at the time. They generated data, they tried them out and, and and where, 
where a model trained on real data got something like 73% accuracy. The, the, the big GAN model only got 42% accuracy and the, the VQVAE only got 54% accuracy. Uh, another way to see the results are, are these plots here. So what these plots show is uh, along the X axis are all the different thousand classes in ImageNet. And each dot represents the, the accuracy. I think it's the, the top one accuracy uh, for the different models. So the blue dots show the accuracy of a model trained on real data. And the red dots show the accuracy of models trained on either the GAN, um, which is on your left, or the, the VQVAE2 model on, on the right. And, and what you can see is that the, the accuracies, the per class accuracies, over a thousand classes for the GAN and the VQVAE, significantly underperform the model trained on real data. And, 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 and they also consider generative data augmentation, but, but when they did this, what they found was that even if you add small amounts of synthetic data into the real data mixture, results degraded very quickly. And so, and, and presumably this is because your generative model is really either biased or the image quality is terrible, um, at least for this task. And, 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 and the only condition in which they were able to get better results was actually with a GAN model with a, a very small truncation factor. So one of the tricks used with generative adversarial models is that when you do generation, rather than drawing a random sample from the Gaussian, you can restrict the sample to be closer and closer to the mode of a Gaussian as a function of the standard deviation or the breadth of the Gaussian. And only when they drew samples really close to the mean of the Gaussian were they getting good results. But, but, and, and, and so what they were effectively doing was, was sacrificing diversity in order to get better image quality. And in that case, they got a small marginal boost in performance and then, but, but very quickly it then started to decay again they, and they got sort of terrible results. And, 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 and so despite the promise of generative models, um, examples of success on complex tasks and complex domains like ImageNet were very hard to come by. And, and that led to a lot of skepticism uh, about the potential for generative data augmentation, for example, as a way of generating more data to improve, improve downstream models. Um, and and, and I've, I've got this quote from one of my colleagues at, at Google DeepMind, Ben Poole, who wrote, you know, everyday uses of, of data augmentation as an example use case for generative models. Yeah, yeah so everyone uses these, but but we've never seen a convincing result. Okay, and, 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 and by that, I, I think partly what Ben has in mind is that manual augmentation methods, which have been developed for years, tend to outperform generative data augmentation by a large margin. Okay, so um, I, I'm, I'm going too slowly. I'm gonna have to speed up for a uh, part of my talk, but but I, I want to go sort of slowly through at least the introduction, the, the introduction to motivate the work. The first really inspiring result that that I've had in the space of generative data augmentation, which was was from a model, um, and it was a it was actually a master's project at the University of Toronto um, uh, by Sajed Naruzi. Um, uh, and 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 the the idea was to use a, a sort of non or to train a non parametric latent variable model. We we trained a VAE, sort of a a, a non parametric VAE, in which in which case the the way to generate samples is actually to start with an exemplar and learn how to deform it in interesting ways, like the one on the right, by exploiting the structure of a latent space. And you you can sort of you can sort of think of it as a memory augmented variational autoencoder in, in which where what you do is you take all, each one of your training images you embed that into the latent space 
And then your prior distribution over the latent space is just a kernel density estimate or a parson window estimator. Essentially, your, 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 your prior over the latent space is just a mixture model where you're putting down one Gaussian mode for every one of your training points in that latent space. And, and so the joint distribution over your images X and your latent variable Z is a, a combination of your prior, which is just this sum of Gaussians in the latent space, and a decoder, which is a, another neural network that takes a latent point and generates an image. And the way you would sample from the model is you would first sample an exemplar, which is a, one of your training data points. You'd then perturb it in the, in the latent space by, by drawing a sample from its associated Gaussian. And then you'd run it through the decoder to generate an image. And, and the model was trained with an evidence lower bound. Um, and we used a few tricks to, to get the model to, to be suitably regularized and really efficient. But with that model, we were able to generate some really interesting results. So these are some results on the top from MNIST and the bottom from Celebe. And, and for each cell, the exemplar that was used is in the top left corner and all the other images from the cell are just random samples conditioned on that exemplar. And they show all sorts of sort of meaningful variations, for example, in the in the style of writing, the stroke width, et cetera. Um, let, let, let me skip over this. The, the most exciting result though that we found in this work um, the, you know, the models performed really well on all sorts of tasks, but the most exciting result was that when we generated synthetic data and added it to real data, we got amazingly good results. And so the way we got these results here, so this is, this is you know, sort of classic old school machine learning, looking at, at MNIST images and classifying the digits. Um, what we found is that if we simply doubled the amount of data by, so every time you choose a mini batch of real data, for every sample of real data, you would generate one augmented synthetic sample. And then we used a, a, a weighted cross entropy loss over all those samples, real and synthetic, where we actually found that weighting the synthetic samples more than the real samples improved our results. And with that, what, what we were able to show against really strong baselines of the best manual augmentations that were out there was that, for example, against a classic uh, MLP, um, in this case with a thousand hidden units, um, um, without the generative data augmentation, we got you know a standard state-of-the-art result of an error rate of about 1.23%. But when we included the generative samples, the error rate plummeted down to 0.77, which was amazing. And when we, when we expanded the number of hidden units, the error rate went all the way down to, to I think, 0.68 or 0.69. And as far as I know, this was the state-of-the-art on this problem, at least it was at the time. And so that was the first time, and, and, and of course, we were doing the happy dance in the hallways. We thought this was really amazing. And so we thought, well, let's, let's apply this to every problem. And it, it, it didn't work. Um, we, you know, we applied it to fashion MNIST and we applied to CIFAR, and we got pretty good results. But when we started applying it to bigger images or ImageNet, et cetera, it didn't really work that well. And we always thought, well, you know, we need a bigger network. We need mumble, mumble, mumble. But, but um, soon after that work, we, we actually had started playing with diffusion models. And so, you know, we were, we were distracted um, and we never went back to the VAE. But in fact, the VAE, which really is this Gaussian smoothed latent embedding is a lot like a diffusion model in some sense, but, but we had a very simplified take on it. Anyway, we went back to, to this notion of cascaded models where, where what we were starting to do was combine the low resolution base models that Jonathan Ho had in his denoising diffusion probabilistic model, the DDPM, the original DDPM paper back in 2020, 
um, which was a seminal piece of work. And we connected that with our own super resolution models. And what we found is that if we conditioned on a class label from Jonathan's model, and then we did super resolution where the super resolution layers were also conditioned on the class label, we were able to generate great results. And, and great results meant we got really good results in terms of of FID and inception score, FID went low, inception score went high, like, you know, all the usual suspects were behaving as you might hope for with a good generative model. But the most exciting result was really that the classification accuracy score jumped all the way up to 63, cutting in half the gap between baseline and previous models. So that got us really excited. But when we tried generative data augmentation, it didn't really work. So, so research is full of failure, um, but, 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 but you learn from that. And so last year or about, about 18 months ago, we decided to start pushing on this harder, but rather than play the usual game in the generative model world of, of training on prescribed data sets and then testing the generalization of the models, what we decided to do was start to think about how do we use these big foundation models? How do we take these text image models and, and which are trained on massive amounts of data and then, in, in, and then use them either fine-tuned or zero-shot for tasks, all sorts of other tasks as generative models, rather than training on these small data sets like MNIST and even ImageNet is a, is a small data set by today's standards. Um, but there was a problem, which is that um, the classes that ImageNet has, like there's a class called trunk. Now, trunk, at least in English, is a word that has multiple meanings. Or there's another class called chest, and chest has also a, a lot of different meanings in English. But of course, what, what they meant was a storage chest. And so if, if you simply put in uh, prompts to imagine, like, you know, a photo of a trunk, you might get an elephant trunk rather than, you know, a storage trunk. And, 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 and so now people have tried to work around this, either, either with some form of prompt engineering or with some sort of prompt inversion. So you could start with ImageNet images, figure out you know, the right prompt and then generate other images with that prompt. What we decided to do was something really simple, which is let's just fine tune the Imagine model on the ImageNet classes and labels themselves. And, and, and so what we did, and, and to do this, you really have to be careful about the choice of of the hyperparameters of the underlying model. We had to do all sorts of different hyperparameter sweeps. And what we found actually is when we, when we, when we figured out the hyperparameters for the sampler of the diffusion model, unlike what Ravuri and, and Vinyas found when they were working with GANs, we actually had to do something quite the opposite. We, we had to greatly choose the hyperparameters to encourage diversity rather than sample quality. The images were, plenty good enough. And what we really needed was diversity. So once we started doing the fine tuning with the right hyperparameters, we go from, so the images, so for four different classes, the images on the left are just samples from Imagine that we got by saying, you know, a, a photo of a mumble. And, and the images on the right are from the fine-tuned model. And what you could see is that every image is now a meaningful image from that respective class. And, and, and these are some more images from the model. And, and, and again, I would be remiss not to show you the usual metrics of performance. And, and what we found was that FID just was amazingly good for this model. And the inception score went through the roof. And at the time, of course, again, we were doing the happy dance, but it's not surprising we should do so much better because rather than training, most of the previous models on this slide were trained only from ImageNet. Imagine was trained with a hundred times more data. Okay, and then we fine tune it. So it learns a better model. It's not surprising it should get a better FID. But what's super interesting was when we looked at the classification accuracy score here in the middle is the cascaded diffusion model I told you about a few minutes ago where we got 63% accuracy. 
Um, and, and, and from the fine-tuned diffusion models, we go all the way up to about just 3% lower than baseline. So we're dramatically closing the gap to a model trained on baseline. And just, just for reference, so here's the plot of the class accuracies compared to the real model or the model trained on real data. Um, the blue dots, are, again, are a model trained on real data. The red dots here are for the cascaded diffusion model. Here's what we get with the, the results of Imagine. Now, in this case, for many classes, our model trained on synthetic data is outperforming the model trained on real data. Okay, and, 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 and so, you know, again, excited. We wanted to see how far can we push this. It worked for a ResNet. Does it work for bigger ResNets like ResNet 152? Does it work for vision transformers? Does it work on all sorts of different models? And so what we actually did was we did these experiments, same experiments, and we did them on 15 different architectures with ResNet models, vision transformers, et cetera, and, and, and all of them using the sort of state-of-the-art recipe that was provided by the authors in the respective papers. And for every case, we saw a boost in performance from models trained on the real data to models trained on a combination of synthetic and, and real data. In this case, we're doubling the data set size. So for every, for every real image, we're using a synthetic image. So we have 2.4 rather than 1.2 million training images to get these results. And then we wondered, of course, does this extend out? Can, can we add not just 1.2 million? Can we double, triple, quadruple? Can we add 10 times more data? And what I'm showing here are the results we got. Um, first for images at 64 by 64 resolution and on the right uh, at 1K by 1K resolution. And what you see in each of these plots on the very left is a model trained solely on real data. And as you move to the right, we're adding more and more synthetic data. In the case of, of the 64 by 64 images, we see a very significant boost in performance by even when we add 10 times as much data. When we go up to the 1K by 1K image, we don't see as dramatic an effect but we definitely see a big boost in performance and that boost in performance over baseline extends out to the case where we're adding five times as much synthetic data as real data. And all the data is weighted the same. Everything in the training procedure is exactly the same as it was before, but we do need to train for longer because we have a lot more data. And, and this was a powerful result at the time and, and, and Philip Isola, generously tweeted about one of our, this, when we first put up the very preliminary work on this up on archive, Philip, you know, gave us a very nice tweet which said, this is, this is a real landmark, uh, you know, sort of phase transition in work on generative models. Okay. Ah. Time for break. Um, how's everyone doing? Okay, we're just getting started. I I, I had to pre prepare this talk last night and, and it was somewhat at last minute. And so I've put together slides, but I actually have no long, I have no idea how long it's gonna go. And so, so there's good news and there's bad news because I'm now starting to see some evidence that, that it's gonna be much longer than the amount of time I have available. Okay, so 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 what? I'm back to the original question. Like like, how how good are these models, and and what are they good for? Well, we're starting to see that they're they're when we actually increase, you know, the the difficulty of the kinds of tasks that we use to evaluate the models. We're seeing lots more room for potential improvement. And models are improving, and 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 other people are now doing this on other tasks. So there's a very nice series of papers by uh, Yang Long Qian and 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 um, and and Li Ji Fan uh, on showing that synthetic data uh, for training contrastive models like 
clip-like models work incredibly well. And so, so, so what I'm talking about really is just one of a bunch of work which is going on in the community, all of which is telling us the same thing. And, 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 and that's great. Um, one question you could ask is, is why do they work? And, and I don't know the answer to that, but, but there's this emerging body of work suggesting that these models are actually pretty well aligned with human perception, interestingly. And, and the way we first started looking at, at that in, at, uh, in my team here at Google is, is, is that uh, Priyank Janey and, and Kevin Clark and Robert Geierhaus they built a classifier using Imagine. And, and the way the classifier worked was as follows, that you, you would take an image, an input image, and you would add noise to it, and then you would denoise it conditioned on a class label or conditioned on a prompt, which is like an image of a bird, and then you would denoise it, or you would give it an image of a cat and denoise it, and an image of an elephant and denoise it. And, 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 and your intuition says that when you give it the prompt, which is the right class, you're going to get a better result when you, when you denoise it compared to the, the wrong classes. And it, indeed, you, do, you then do this for all the different classes that you're talking about. And, 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 and the class you select is the one um, that, that gives you the best evidence-based variational bound. And, 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 and or the highest likelihood effectively. And, and that way you can actually build a classifier with a generative model. And, and, and what they found was that this classifier working zero shot was sort of state of the art. It worked really, really well, especially compared to other discriminative models or embeddings like CLIP. Um, but even more interesting than that, they, they found that it, it, it seemed to align with human perception well. So, so as just one example case, um, one of the intriguing differences between human perception and, and deep learning discriminative models is actually in the extent to which they rely on texture or shape to make a discrimination, where it's fairly well known that deep learning models rely predominantly on visual texture to classify things, while humans rely mainly on shape. So while the image on the, the left for both people and a deep network will be classified as elephant because it's a texture of an elephant, and, and the image in the middle there, cat, will be classified both by a human and a deep learning model as a cat. When you give it an image which has a Q conflict, it's not at all clear what will go on, but in this case, a human will generally say cat and a deep learning model will generally say elephant. Okay. And, 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 and so Robert Geierhaus and his, his colleagues actually showed that, that this was true for a wide variety of different models. And what they're showing here are um, for a whole bunch of classes along the rows and for a whole bunch of models, like each little dot is a different model. Um, these are all discriminative models, and they all show a bias toward texture on these Q conflict images. And if you look at humans, humans are far to the right. They're shape bias. And when we looked at the classifier from Imagine, it really matches human performance extremely well. Now, this is important because one of the benefits of relying on shape information is that you get a degree of robustness. And and um, and so and 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 so then they tested imagine performance against human performance on a wide variety of of sort of weird out of distribution data sets like line drawings and and color manipulated images and noisy images etc. And what they found is that unlike most discriminative models, again imagine matches human performance. And and one question you can also ask is, but do these do different models make the same errors on the same images? And what this shows here is, is a large plot for a whole bunch of different models or people on whether they correlate in their errors. And so the, the brighter the dot, the higher the correlation in the errors between two models. And, and the upper 60 by 60 part of this big chart, these are all discriminatively trained models. Uh, convolutional networks, ResNets, 
vision transform, et cetera. And this bottom set of 10 by 10 points, those are just 10 different people. And, and what they found was that imagine and stable diffusion as diffusion-based generative models seem to align much better with people than with the other discriminative networks. So, so, so a growing body of evidence that these, these models really seem to behave more like people. Okay, the next problem we started looking at, and I have to apologize because I'm running out of time, I'm gonna skip over this. We started to ask the question, and this is the topic of the talk, I guess, are these models good for computer vision? And, and, and um, to shorten what I was going to say, the answer is yes. Um, they really work well. And, and, and we wanted to know, like, can we take pre-trained models, like from Imagine, text-to-image models, and can we fine-tune them to do things like object segmentation, object detection, estimation of depth, estimation of optical flow. We want to see whether these models would do a good job. And we also wanted to see whether a simple generic architecture would work the same, would work uniformly well across a wide variety of tasks. Because in the computer vision field, each of these tasks is typically dominated by very specialized task-specific architectures and training procedures. And we want to know, would one architecture work on all of these? And, and just to show you some results, so we, we looked at one study of, of training two models, one for depth estimation, where at every pixel you want to know how far away the scene object is in that direction, and the other being optical flow, where we want to know for every pixel in one image, what's the corresponding pixel in the next frame of video. And, and I'm going to skip over a bunch of slides, so you have to, you have to excuse me. But, but what we found is that these, these models worked incredibly well. So, so, for example, in the case of optical flow, this is um, one image of a, of a video on the left from a self-driving car sequence. And, and the state of the art up to a few months ago was a model called RAFT. And I'm showing its optical flow field on top and, and our model, which is, I don't know what DDVM stands for anymore. I, I think it's something like uh, I, I, dense vision mumble diffusion mumble model, something like that. But that was our model and, and it just does a way better result. And what I'm showing on the bottom are just some zoomed in and you can see it's just, it's, it's, it's done a better job at outlining the objects, et cetera. Um, and and, 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 and um, in other, we actually built these models so they work in a course defined fashion because we wanted them to work on high res images or images of arbitrary, um, uh, eccentricity, like, you know, rectangular images, square images, et cetera. And so what we built was a model that would, would essentially learn, do the task at low res and then zoom in patch wise to do a better job. And, and that's what I'm showing here on the bottom, the low res version of the person on the bicycle. And then the next stage, the high res, which, which, you know, finds the wheels and the front fork of the bicycle and detailed structure of the person. It just seemed to work really well, really well. So skip over this. And we, and we got very similar results with depth and we're really excited. We just released a little while ago, a new metric in the wild depth um, algorithm, which, which works for indoor scenes, outdoor scenes. You just, you give it an RGB image, it gives you depth back. Okay. Um, and so just, just to recap where we are, and I'm not done. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I think there are three bits that I've talked about at, at this point. One is that generative models are becoming good for generative data augmentation, where they're fantastic for synthesis, or at least we have, we have signs of life that these models can begin to generate data, which will help us do stuff. They seem to align pretty well with human perception and the representations that humans use. And they really seem good for, for vision tasks. And, and, and so, and what I wanted to do to close it out is just 
give you a hint of some of the other things we've been doing recently, which of course I'm 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 super excited about, but I don't have time to go into a lot of detail. But but let me just flip through one or two slides each. One of the things we're doing now is is we're trying to get rid of the cascades because cascades were a really good tool for allowing you to go from a low res image to a high res image. But really it would be ideal if we could learn in one stage a model that went from a label or a text prompt to a high resolution image. And we're now able to do that with a sort of progressive growing architecture and training procedure that now lets us train uh, up to 1K or even 4K pixel-based diffusion models from a prompt without cascades whatsoever. And, and the images that, that are, are, can be generated from these are, are really impressive. Um, another thing we're looking at are other ways of fine-tuning these models. So not just fine-tuning them on, on tediously curated, you know, manually curated data sets, but fine-tuning them on different reward functions. And we started looking at this a year ago, a year and a half ago, and, and, and a bunch of other people were doing the same things using reinforcement learning to try and, and optimize rewards. But what the guys in the team realized, Paul Vickel and Kevin Clark realized, is that actually as long as you have a differentiable reward function, which many reward functions are for aesthetics or, or you know, image composition, we can actually differentiate through the entire sampling procedure of the diffusion model and do direct gradient-based optimization on these reward functions. And so, um, for example, um, using two different aesthetic reward functions, um, which we're sort of using here with PIC score on the left and, and human preference score on the right, a generic model um, given a prompt might produce something like these two images, but as we, as we increase the amplitude of the fine-tuned model, we start to see the images become a lot more elaborate and populated with all sorts of complexity. And, and so we're really excited about that. Um, and, and, and this has not been released yet. And the team promised me it would be released by today. And they told me last night it was not gonna happen, but but, or they promise, so they're gonna get it up to archive by two o'clock today and it should be online tomorrow. We have a, a new model. We have a, a, a new model, which is a four dimensional model, which, which is to say it's, it's a model that allows you to have control over where the camera is and time. And so what we do is we condition on a, a single frame or multiple frames, and then we generate a set of images where for each image, we specify where the camera is relative to the first image and where time is relative to the first image. So if you fix time to be constant, you're just generating 3D consistent views of a scene. And, and, and if, you, if you maybe hold the camera constant and vary time, you get video, or you can do both. Think of like the stop, the, the stop camera sort of action mumble that they used in the matrix, right? The stop frame animation. We, we can do that kind of stuff with the models. And, and, and um, these are just samples. And all of these samples, they start with a single image and then, and, and then they move the camera through the scene and, and, and the model just generates stuff. Um, and, and it can be used for all sorts of things. You can condition on two frames and then, and, then, and then generate the rest of a video. You can do video to video translation where you're, you're looking at the same scene from a different point of view in the other video. Um, or you can do image to 4D. So in, in, the bottom, uh, in the bottom right, we start with a single image of a street scene and then we, we run we, we move the camera forward or, and it can go around corners, et cetera, and, and we play time. And so what it generates are time varying, three-dimensional, 3D consistent scenes. Um, these are a few more examples just with images taken off the web or images generated from a text to image model. Um, anyway, and on that, I, I'm gonna, I'm getting off the hairy eyeball down here. I've got to stop talking. Um, but 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 let me finish my talk. But let me let me say with with um, all due thanks 
um, that I didn't do all this work. There were a whole bunch of people on my team at Google DeepMind that did this work, and it's it's just a fantastic team to work with. And some of the people from the team will actually be here later today um, 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 at the career fair uh, mixer. I forget what the names are. Um, but but I think there are a couple of people on the team that have open positions, so they're looking to hire. So, um, but but let me let me stop there. I'm happy to take questions, and I will be around. I will also be around for the mixer and the career fair tonight. So if you have questions and you want to take it offline, I'm happy to talk to anyone as as long as I can. So thanks for your attention. Thank you for the talk. Um, regarding the difference between like GANs and diffusion models, it seems to me like GANs are more complicated, very difficult to make them converge. You need to use a lot of tricks. Uh, and the diffusion models just look a lot more elegant, easier to make them converge, and they even work so much better with the only downside of being slower. So I really do not understand why GANs came out in 2014 and it took six more years for diffusion models, which is something that in my head, at least, it's much simpler to, like, what, why something simpler would take much longer to come out? Yeah, I, I, I have no clue. Um, I, I mean, you should give the talk. I, I, I think you're right. You know, your premise is right. I, I mean, I, I think it's important to point out that the first diffusion model um, paper came out in 2015. And, and it was largely ignored until 2020. And at that time, Yang Song and others were starting to do score matching, which of course is very related to diffusion models. And it was Jonathan Ho that really tied the connection between diffusion models and score matching and sort of you know, breathed life into into the diffusion models. Why it took so long? I mean, uh, when the guys on my team showed me some of the preliminary, I mean, it was really it was it was almost a student project. They showed me the preliminary results on the super resolution stuff. I just about jumped out of my seat. I mean, I for years had never worked on super resolution because I thought it was sort of a dumb task because nothing worked that well. And and when they showed me the results, I was just totally blown away. So we jumped on it really fast and we immediately had sort of six people working on it at, at full speed for a year or two to come up with this series of results. But why it took us so long, I don't know. You know, I, I guess I spent 10 years trying to figure out what, what probabilistic PCA was and, and uh, I should have been doing something different. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, you can sort of ask this about research in general. Um, there are all sorts of papers you see and you think, God, why didn't I do that? Um, that's the way research works. Hi. Um so you mentioned you have these reward functions to get different kind of flavors out of the diffusion model. Um, unfortunately, I really don't know how these models work, but in RL, um, typically we don't want to act greedy with respect to the reward, but we want to get as much value as possible. So sometimes we have to, go, uh, have to do something that is actually in the reward function in the current state, uh, not the best thing to do, but that sets us up to get more value later. So, is differentiating through the reward function, like is that really the correct thing to do or shouldn't you look at the value function or is, is that what's happening? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. So um, it's not totally obvious to me that we should be training on reward functions directly. Uh, we might be a lot better off trying to train directly on human preference data um, but, 
Yeah, I, 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 I'm not beyond that. I'm, I'm not sure I have a good answer for you. I, I think, I mean, what I was, okay, so what, here's what I was excited about was that when, when I first found out we could, we could, um, we could optimize reward functions. What I was excited about was the fact that almost all the reward functions we have currently are, are, are really not very good. In fact, when you optimize them, you realize how bad they are. When you do early stopping in the optimization, you get way better results than if you actually optimize them. And the reason is it's really hard to build reward functions that that encourage the diversity and the quality that you really want. I think that's what you see in reinforcement learning all the time. What I was really excited about when we were able to optimize the reward functions, I, th I thought, okay, finally now we might be able to learn really interesting reward functions because in the inner loop of learning good reward functions in some ways, in some senses, the optimization of those functions. And yeah. so that's what I was really interested in. But I, 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 but but there's part of me that thinks maybe we actually don't necessarily need the reward functions. Yeah, I mean, um, it's uh, the question is kind of coming from uh, like RLHF, right? That we also learn a reward function. But then we don't directly, op I mean, we optimize that reward function, but that uh, entails learning a value function for that reward function. So it's, uh, but uh, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, think we, I think we can skip some of that. I, I'm not sure that's necessary.